In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, our man Christ is risen. Amen. I greet you this morning, brothers and sisters, on a blustery day. However, it doesn't diminish our joy in the resurrection. I want to compliment all of our singers, and I want to give praise to want to give praise to all of you for the efforts that you've made recently in Pascha, and also the efforts you made in the very beginning of Pascha, so that we could have a celebration here. It's really appropriate at this time now that we're in the halfway point of our Paschal period to take a look at what's actually happening. We say Christ is risen, but we can honestly say, Jesus loves me. It sounds a bit self-centered. It is. Because Jesus Christ, the living and true God, is God-man, not just for the entire human race. God-man and creator, not just of the cosmos. That's too easy for God. God does the hard thing. God sanctifies individuals at every microscopic moment of our existence. Because we're contending for our salvation. We can be a bit selfish and say, Jesus loves me. Because the hope is, is you would turn and then say, Jesus, I love you. And those of you who are visiting, I hope this message can resonate with you from afar through the ministrations of pixels and electricity. You're able to say, Jesus loves me. The power of the divine liturgy this morning reaches you. And also in return, you're able to say from your seat, or maybe you're standing, that would be very good. Jesus, I love you. Then we know the ministry of our broadcasting is truly working. Or God forbid you're laying in bed tonight because you didn't get to anything today, because we all know that can happen to all of us. And you catch a little bit of this service. I hope it will move you to say, not only Christ is risen, but Jesus Christ, I love you. And why is this so? Because I said it's not enough that God would save the cosmos, but that God would save us at every heartbeat. The author, the, the novelist Dostoevsky says in one of his most immortal lines, that God and the devil are contending for the salvation of the man, the woman, the human race. And that contention takes place in the heart. It's happening right in the heart. That's where it's all stirring and turning. And so in that regard, I'd like to leave you, all of you, with an important message, which is your role in the love of God, saying, Jesus, I love you, and Christ is risen, but also your role in constructing your life, bringing your life closer to the life of the church, which, by the way, the life of the church is the life of Christ. The church is Christ. The church is the way Jesus saves hearts, moves repentance, delivers the world. At this time, I don't need to tell anyone here, anyone who is cognizant of the news, that we're living in difficult times. It is entirely possible in belief to hold that what we're doing here this morning small as it is, is not small in the order of grace. All of these churches where divine liturgy has just celebrated as the sun moves from east to west and all of these liturgies begin to take place and now they're starting in Chicago and soon they'll happen in the west coast. This movement that's passing is the same movement that initiated Pascha for us in the first place when 12 o'clock struck here. Whether we wanted it or not, the fire had to be lit whether we're on time or not, we can be late, but that moment has already happened and then comes the celebration because it's in this grand motion moving across. That's the movement of the church and we're being invited to come into it. And how deep does this church image go? Well, it goes back in time quite a long way. Let me take you back to 598 BC. In this year, a young man who is now a prisoner in Babylon, a Jew, will begin to have the first of several and many visions. His name, Ezekiel. 
And he will have these visions and they will be preserved orally and be part of our tradition. One of them, the most outstanding, I believe, for Christians is this. We heard it on Good Friday, Good and Holy Friday. The resurrection of Israel. Here you have a prisoner, an exile, an outcast, a young man, younger man, who will come in his exile to realize that Nebuchadnezzar will finish the job that he started, and he will receive word, the report, that in 587, not just 10 years later, that Jerusalem not only was attacked, but the temple itself was destroyed. And with that news, he will then have the great vision that we know so well in the church, the resurrection of the bones of the house of Israel, where the bones come out of the earth and take flesh, and the entire house is rebuilt by the power of God. It's one of the most magnificent images in scripture. And for us, of course, it's the foreshadowing. It's the prelude for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the foreshadowing of the hope of what is called the sleep of the just. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all of the family, David, all of the family of Israel, all the saints and all the sinners and all the prophets and all the judges are waiting in the sleep of the just for what is called the harrowing of hell. It's the other side of the principal icon of the resurrection, what's going on underneath the resurrection, that Israel is being rebuilt. And now comes an even more outstanding mystery. We are part of that. We are part of those bones that take on flesh. We are part of the just through baptism. And that now leads us to those myrrh bearers. And a congratulation to everyone who's celebrating a name today, the many Marthas and Marys. And if we have, I hope we have, it would be so wonderful also to a Joseph of Arimathea to be part of this. What happened with these ladies? These women, good pious women, have come to the tomb in the early morning. But there's something wrong with this story. It's even in the gospel. They've come with the anointments to finish a ritual of the Old Testament. But they didn't bring anybody to move the, the, the stone. They're also walking at night, early in the morning, without an escort. You don't, people don't do that, not then. And in some parts of our country, sadly, not now either, do you walk out at night. So the question is, were they coming only to find a dead man? Or were they already holding in their heart the hope of the resurrection? that it could go the other way, right to the very moment. The psalm, taste and see that the Lord is good. They were keeping that in their mind. They were keeping also Jesus' prophecy to them that the Son of Man must suffer at the hands of the authorities, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, and will die and will rise again. It seems that the women have got this absolutely worked out that they're between death and resurrection. If you will, they came prepared for both. And it's the angel that sets them in motion. He is risen. The empty tomb is the evidence for them. And at that moment, the proclamation then will go out. That proclamation will reach the apostles. The women go first, the men go second. And yet our church has inverted the order of the story. We put Thomas first, and we put the women second. Because the church, in its mysteries, realizes that all of the resurrection stories are actually part of the Holy Eucharist. And so it is appropriate in the church's consciousness that we would get a story about doubt, and we would get a story of an apostle being healed of his doubt, and not just healed in any way, but healed through touch. The sacred touch of Thomas to the Lord is an apostolic moment. It's Eucharistic. It's the analog to what many of you just received this morning, the intimate contact with Jesus Christ through Holy Communion, which is a sacred touch. And so it happens that the church on purpose is reversing this order so that the Eucharist 
The divine liturgy can become paramount for us as the way to understand and to know the resurrection of Christ. And yet, on this second Sunday, we have to go backward in time and realize now that in the order of historical time, it's this day that comes first. It's this day through the power of the word that Ezekiel's vision of the resurrection of Israel is fulfilled in us, that we are the new children of paradise. And with that, we can confidently say, Christ is risen, Jesus, I love you, and Lord Jesus, love me please. The blessings of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love towards mankind, always.